The fact is, science and its basic methods are easy to follow and abide by. The pillars of the scientific method consist of asking questions, doing background research, constructing a hypothesis based on the testing and analyzation of that data, drawing a conclusion and reporting the results. Scientific research must be repeatable, verifiable, demonstrable, as well as able to undergo a healthy amount of scrutiny and criticism. Simple as pie. What often gets in the way of the pure pursuit of science is the human ego. Cordiality and congeniality are lost when the unadulterated quest for truth gets tainted by all sorts of corrupting forces such as money, power, greed, and pride. All things quite prevalent in the current collective human condition. We must always keep emblazoned in our minds the understanding that ridicule, belittlement, derision, disparaging and derogatory remarks, ad hominem attacks, and the like have no place within scientific inquiry, nor in social civility. In the noble pursuit of science, if one attacks another for simply making an inquiry or asking a question, you can be sure that that individual is not, in any way, shape, or form, engaging in the scientific method. Period. We should be grateful we live in a time that the great book of occult knowledge is being opened wide by so many scholars, researchers, and seekers who pursue their interests for no other reason than the great and undying passion they have for truth. I can decidedly say that I certainly no longer believe that the sun is 93 million miles away, that we revolve around it at roughly 66,000 miles an hour, and that the earth is a sphere 25,000 miles at its equator. The entire model that I have been told was absolute fact I now have enormous reservations with, and honestly cannot even begin to defend it anymore. The amount of paradoxes, anomalies, dubious, problematic, and unproven ideas one has to swallow in order to wholesale endorse such a model is now, very clear to me to be, too extensive and numerous to continue putting any sort of faith or focus on such an explanation of our earthly system. Ο Ερατοσθένης ο Κυριναίος ήταν αρχαίος Έλληνας, μαθηματικός, γεωγράφος, αστρονόμος και ποιητής. Γεννήθηκε στην Κυρίνη και έζησε, σπούδασε και πέθανε στην Αλεξάνδρεια, η οποία και ήταν τότε που εκτέλεσε ίσως το σημαντικότερο πείραμα για το οποίο έμεινε γνωστός στην ιστορία. Μέτρησε την περιφέρεια της γης χρησιμοποιώντας ένα κοντάρι και λίγη γεωμετρία. Οι αρχαίοι Έλληνε είχαν καταλάβει πως η επιφάνεια του πλανήτη καμπυλώνει, γιατί έβλεπαν τα πλοία που απομακρύνονταν από το λιμάνι να εξαφανίζονται από κάτω προς τα πάνω. Επίση, σήμερα γνωρίζουμε πω η γη δεν είναι μια τέλεια σφαίρα και οι ακτίνε του ήλιου δεν φτάνουν σε εμά ακριβώ παράλληλε. Η ακρίβεια τη μέτρηση του, ωστόσο, δεν έχει ιδιαίτερη σημασία. Παρόλο που τα εργαλεία που χρησιμοποίησε ήταν πρωτόγωνα, ο υπολογισμό του ήταν πολύ κοντά στην πραγματική τιμή, γι' αυτό γιατί η ιδέα στην ουσία τη ήταν σωστή. Ο Ερατοσθένη, σαν γνήσιο επιστήμονα, έκανε μια παρατήρηση. Στηρίχθηκε στι προηγούμενε γνώσει για τη σφαιρική γη και κατασκεύασε το κατάλληλο πείραμα για να κάνει τον υπολογισμό του. Απέδειξε πω καμιά φορά μια απλή ιδέα και ένα περίεργο μυαλό είναι όλα όσα χρειάζεσαι για να αλλάξει τον κόσμο. Fun fact! 1700 χρόνια μετά το πείραμα του Ερατοσθένη, ο θαλασσοπόρο Χριστόφορο Κολόμβο, χρησιμοποιώντα λαθεμένε εκτιμήσει για την περιφέρεια τη γη, ξεκίνησε από τα Κανάρια νησιά. Ένα century BC, ο Ερατοσθένη measured the differences between shadows cast by poles in Syene and Alexandria to calculate more than 2000 years before rockets and space travel the circumference of the entire globular Earth with, for the time, impressive accuracy. Word got around that the earth was a round shape after that. The same phenomenon Eratosthenes measured could be explained by a flat earth if the sun were only a few thousand miles away and 32 miles across. The math would work out the same. The math would work out the same. The math would work out the same.
There are literally hundreds of thousands of people who are exploring the notion that this Mother Earth that we live on does not revolve around the sun and is in fact a motionless flat plane and the stars, sun, and moon, literally the entirety of the cosmos, revolve around the Earth, a model called geocentrism. A majority of these folk are very dedicated to their cause and are making their case with passion and gusto. There are hordes of independent researchers online who are posting videos with much evidence to support their claims, and average everyday people have taken up doing scientific experiments for themselves to test the veracity of the claims made by scientists and space agencies across the known world that the Earth is part of a heliocentric or sun-centered system. Blogs have been written, podcasts recorded, comment sections flooded, hell, there's even been several books written about it. These people are dedicated and very serious about supporting a new flat earth model to replace our currently accepted heliocentric system. Astrolabe. The Astrolabe is an ancient astronomical computer that has many uses, including, as told to us by Wikipedia, locating and predicting the positions of the sun, moon, planets, and stars, determining local time, giving local latitude, and vice versa, surveying, and triangulation. The Astrolabe was used during classical antiquity, the Islamic Golden Age, the European Middle Ages, and the Renaissance for all of these purposes. The early astrolabe was supposedly invented by Apollonius of Pergab around 220 BCE, which means that the astrolabe has been prevalent throughout history for over 2,000 years. Astrolabes can be purchased or built today and can be used with precision on our modern night skies. We are going to watch a brief clip from a video given at a TED conference about the astrolabe, its history, uses, and functionality. You can find the complete video on the official TED Talk site, and I would highly recommend watching the video in its entirety. So an astrolabe is relatively unknown uh, in today's world, but at the time, in the 13th century, it was the gadget of the day. It was the world's first popular computer, and it was a device that, is, in fact, is a model of the sky. So the different parts of the astrolabe in this particular type, the reet corresponds to the position of the stars, the plate corresponds to a, a coordinate system, and the mater has some scales and puts it all together. If you were an educated child, you would know how to not only use the astrolabe, you would also know how to make an astrolabe. And we know this because the first treatise on the astrolabe, the first technical manual in the English language, was written by Geoffrey Chaucer. Yes, that Geoffrey Chaucer in 1391 to his little Lewis, his 11-year-old son. And in this um, book, uh, Little Lewis would, uh, would know the big idea. And the central idea that makes this computer work is this thing called stereographic projection. And basically the, the concept is how do you represent the three-dimensional image of the night sky that surrounds us onto a flat, portable, two-dimensional surface. The idea is actually relatively simple. Imagine that the Earth is at the center of the universe, and surrounding it is the sky projected onto a sphere. Each point on the surface of the sphere is mapped through the bottom pole onto a flat surface where it's then recorded. So the North Star corresponds to the um, center of the device. The ecliptic, which is the path of the sun, moon, and planets, correspond to an offset circle. The bright stars correspond to little daggers on the reet, and the altitude corresponds to the plate system. Now the real genius of the astrolabe is not just the projection. The real genius is that it brings together two coordinate systems so they fit perfectly. There's the position of the sun, moon, and planets on the movable reet, and then there's their location on the sky as seen from a certain latitude on the back plate. So that's just one use. <laughs> it's incredible. Uh, there's probably 350, 400 uses. In fact, there's a text that has over a thousand uses of this first computer. On the back, there's scales and measurements for terrestrial navigation. You can survey with it. The city of Baghdad was surveyed with it. It could be used for calculating mathematical equations of all different types, and it would take a full university course to illustrate it. The Astrolabe is a computer, a calculator, a perfect measuring mechanism based on a geocentric, stationary model of the Earth. This piece of artistic and scientific brilliance needs no accolade, nor pomp or circumstance to announce its own craftsmanship, for its modern-day workability itself proves the genius of its design. A very profound question we must ask ourselves is, if the Sun is traveling at roughly half a million miles an hour, and the Earth rotates around it at roughly 66,000 miles an hour, 
How is it even possible to map and track the same set of stars for thousands of years? If we are to assume that the ancients created this calculator with a complete lack of understanding the true heliocentricity of our solar system, and merely created this calculator of the heavens as understood from their perspective and viewpoint, how is it possible they could have crafted such an instrument that maintains such precision over thousands of years? To somehow think that an instrument of such a high and accurate degree of calculability merely works today out of dumb luck or by accident is rather obtuse. Whoever created this instrument, whatever culture or person made it, their knowledge and ingenuity has withstood the test of time. It would seem that the heavens and the working of its cycles have been known and measurable for a very, very long time. Η διεθνής ομάδα είχε και έναν ανταγωνιστή. Ο Μάικλ Ράιτ δούλευε εδώ και 25 χρόνια στο Λονδίνο, πάνω στο γρίφο του μηχανισμού. And slowly you get the metal to work round the instrument till it gets nearly symmetrical. Then you can put it on there. Where it's tight, you... Ο Ράιτ έχει κατασκευάσει διάφορα αντικείμενα, από μουσικά όργανα μέχρι ένα λειτουργικό μοντέλο του μηχανισμού των αντικηθήρων. Ήταν ειδικό συνεργάτη στο Μουσείο Επιστημών στο Λονδίνο. Προηγούμενε έρευνε είχαν δείξει πω τα οριχάλκινα θράψματα με τα γρανάζια του κάποτε βρίσκονταν μέσα σε ένα ξύλινο κουτί. Έτσι ο Ράιτ έφτιαξε το μηχάνημά του μέσα σε ένα κουτί και το κινεί με ένα χερούλι στο πλάι. Πιστεύει ότι το μοντέλο του είναι πιο αυθεντικό από ένα ψηφιακό. You could say it's um it's a deceit because the the digital version has no friction, the parts have no mass, no inertia. You don't have any problem with stiffness or strength. Parts don't bend, the parts don't break. Το μοντέλο του Μάικλ Ράιτ είχε μια ριζοσπαστική προσθήκη. Βασιζόμενο σε προηγούμενε ιδέε του Πράι, έφτιαξε ένα πολύ περίπλοκο και ιδιοφιέ πλανητάριο στο μπροστινό μέρο του μηχανισμού. It's very obvious there's a lot of mechanism lost from the front of this, which is the big fragment. There was a pattern of pillars on this wheel. It had structure, uh, some, some sort of structure that revolved like a merry-go-round. And what I ended up with was models of the the planets. This is a model of the of the Greek cosmos, geocentric. This is a model of the of the Greek cosmos, geocentric. This is a model of the of the Greek cosmos, geocentric. You can think of this cover plate in the middle as representing the Earth, and everything goes round it. The easy one to spot is the Moon because that's the fastest moving thing on the dial, and it's the front pointer. As the month progresses, day by day, slowly, the new Moon crescent appears. Until after about a week, you have first quarter, the half moon showing. About another week, and it's full moon. The night sky was the ancient Greeks' television. What else were you going to look at at night? Um, people were much, much more aware of the sky. The calendar was organized according to the moon. Official positions changed. Debts became payable on the new moon. You had to have a calendar that in some way reconciled the year controlled by the sun with the month controlled by the moon. They're tricky numbers and uh, you, they're built into the model. Developing a society because of all of these different toxins known to affect brain function, we're seeing a society that not only has a lot more people of lower IQ, but a lot fewer people of higher IQ. In other words, a dumbing down, a chemical dumbing down of society. So everyone's sort of mediocre. That leaves them dependent on government because they can't excel. We have these people of lower IQ who are totally dependent. Then we have this mass of people who are going to believe anything they're told because they can't really think clearly. And very few people of very high IQ who have good cognitive function who can figure this all out. And that's what they want. So, you know, you can kind of piece it together as to why they are so insistent in spending so many hundreds of millions of dollars of propaganda money to dumb down society.
For many, the initial response to hearing the idea that people are actually considering the notion that we live in an Earth-centered or geocentric universe usually takes the form of something like the following. Who in the bloody hell thinks the world is flat? What kind of moron believes such nonsense? Have you ever been up in an airplane and seen the curvature of the Earth? Stupid. Shit is round like the other planets. Ever hear of the Hubble telescope? Dummy. The majority of us, at least those who receive their education from a federally mandated academic curriculum, have been told since kindergarten about the rotundity and sphericity of the Earth. In fact, globes often find their way into classrooms across the world. The Earth being a spinning globe and going around the sun was and is taught as absolute fact. But if you were like me, you probably often question whether or not you really learned anything in school. There are many people who ridicule the idea of even having a discussion or debate on this subject. For many, there is a sheer absurdity of even questioning the rotundity of the Earth in the first place. A vast majority of the public, many of whom more than likely consider themselves educated, feel that such considerations are for the brain dead and primitive. To even consider the notion that the Earth is flat, for many, is a complete waste of time. And that is exactly why we are going to investigate this subject today. Is there any great flaw or fault in restating our assumptions and clarifying with scientific precision the things that we have come to know to be quote unquote true and without question? What is so wrong with critically examining fundamental and widely accepted ideas about such things as the shape of the earth and the nature of the system that we reside in? How often have we ever even considered questioning the celestial mechanics of the world in which we live? Are we supposed to take at face value the promulgations made by governments and self-proclaimed authorities of science informing us about the heavens above? If you were like me, you take to heart what the great George Carlin said about governments. How much does the average person even know about the movements of the planets, the sun, the moon, and the earth? If the geocentric model proves out to be true, there can really be no question that this deception is, invariably, one of the greatest conspiracies of all time. If such is true, mankind has been sold a lie since the day we were born, and that lie was a lie dreamed up by extremely intelligent dark occult forces, people who have been at work for over several generations. And what is ultimately being hidden and stolen is man's destiny, purpose, and direct proof of his place at the center of all creation. This is a model of the of the Greek cosmos geocentric. This is a model of the of the Greek cosmos geocentric. The math would work out the same. The math would work out the same. The math would work out the same. The math would work out the 